By the middle of 1944, Allied forces were regularly flying raids of 1,000 bombers over Nazi Germany. Escorted by powerful long-range fighters like the P-51 Mustang, the German Luftwaffe could put up little resistance to these vast air armadas. But in July 1944, a new German fighter appeared in the skies, capable of flying at over 100 miles per hour faster than the Mustang, and armed with four 30mm cannons, it could outmaneuver the escorts and destroy a bomber in a single pass. The new German fighter, which put fear into the Allied pilots and made the German Luftwaffe feel invincible, was the jet-propelled Messerschmitt 262. The first time I saw a German jet, the ME262, I could hardly believe it, how fast it was. At this time, we were again not the hunted, but the hunter. Using extraordinary archive film and color reenactments, Battle stations dives into the high-speed world of the race to get the first jet fighter ever to fly in combat. Ironically, the origins of the fearsome Messerschmitt 262 were born out of a peace treaty. Following its defeat in World War I, Germany was forced by the Allies to sign an agreement which banned them from developing further conventional aircraft technologies but rocket and jet propulsion were never mentioned. In the 1930s, Adolf Hitler began to build his vision for Nazi Germany. That vision included the most powerful air force in the world. To achieve this, the air force must have speed. At that time, it was realized that to fly faster meant flying higher where the air is thinner. But the higher a plane flies, the harder it is for a propeller to draw it through the air. At the German University of Göttingen, a young engineer named Hans von Ohain began development work on a turbojet engine. A brilliant student, Hans von Ohain was only 21 years old when he first conceived the idea of a jet engine. That's fine. He was a technician with an inquisitive mind. He was very good at theoretical problems, and he studied physics as well. Encouraged by his professor, the young engineer began to build a working prototype. Meanwhile, in Britain, totally unaware of what was happening in Germany, a 26-year-old Royal Air Force pilot named Frank Whittle was developing a gas turbine engine. In 1932, he filed a patent on the world's first jet engine. In this early film, Frank Whittle himself explains the principles of his engine. Look, this represents a centrifugal type compressor. I use this to pull in air at the front and to compress it into combustion chambers like this, where the injection and burning of fuel heats and expands the air and gives it enough energy to drive a turbine which drives the compressor. This design was to become the world's first fully working jet engine. High velocity propelling jet. But Whittle found it difficult to get his design taken seriously by the British military establishment. The scientific advice at that time, and i.e. by the people in power, was it couldn't work. It required just too much power to make it work. And the officials at the ministry listened to that advice. And Whittle was very much seen as a bit of an upstart that was trying to sort of make his name and push forward an idea that was not really achievable at that time. The delays which were to hamper Whittle were to prove a distinct advantage for German jet engine development. By 1935, Hans von Ohain had developed a test engine and on the advice of his professor approached the aircraft manufacturer Ernst Heinkel for financial support. Heinkel was known as a patron of radical concepts, especially those which would lead to higher speeds and enable him to build the fastest aeroplane in the world. Impressed, Heinkel recognized the enormous potential of such an engine and ordered the construction of a full-scale power plant. O'Hein and his team of engineers accepted the task and set to work on what would become the HES-3 jet engine. Back in Britain, 
Whittle had finally managed to raise enough funds to establish a small company. Located in the little Leicestershire town of Lutterworth, he called it Power Jets. In 1937, he tested his engine for the first time. Whittle had all sorts of problems when the engine on powering up ran away with itself and just kept going and going, the, the thrust built up, and Whittle just stood there and waited for it to go bang because he was just transfixed by it. He also was enthralled by what was happening. This was his baby, and he didn't want it to, to break, fall apart. He was looking after it, although everyone else sensibly left the area very quickly. Despite many setbacks and failures, Whittle finally succeeded in controlling his engine. But the British government was still not convinced, preferring instead conventional designs for aircraft and engines. Whittle faced resistance to his invention throughout the 1930s. Previous experiments with jet propulsion indicated that turboprops would be heavy, expensive, and very unreliable. The British Air Ministry and the Royal Aircraft Establishment saw that turbojets were not going to be a viable alternative for aerial propulsion until 10 or 15 years down the road. Throughout this time, Frank Whittle did not know that the Germans were developing a jet engine. So good was the secrecy surrounding the project, little was known about what was being developed at all. Whittle's patents, which were released in 35, um, and were published in Germany, in German, in the technical magazines of that time, made available to, to von Ohain uh, a load of material that Whittle had previously had as a patent. And I think it would be fair to say at that time that von Ohain would have gone down the road of reading these. He wouldn't have copied it, but he would certainly have read it and interpreted it into the designs he was involved in. As the clouds of war gathered on the horizon, the Nazi regime had become more determined than ever to develop faster forms of propulsion for its Luftwaffe. In 1938, the Reich Air Ministry issued a specification to the German aviation industry for a single-seat turbojet fighter. Spurred on by this directive, Heinkel's team pushed ahead, designing an aircraft to be powered by O'Hein's jet engines. From the drawing boards of twin brothers Siegfried and Walter Gunther, the first practical jet-powered aircraft was to take flight. It was called the HE-178. On August the 27th, 1939, one week before the outbreak of World War II, the little Heinkel 178 took to the air. The Germans had succeeded in being first in getting a jet airborne. But the race for the first jet fighter had only just begun. On September the 3rd, 1939, the Second World War began. And over the next few weeks, Germany swept all before her. Flushed with the success of having just flown the world's first jet aircraft, it was two months before Ernst Heinkel and Hans von Ohain were able to demonstrate their plane to the Nazi government. But with its army conquering all, and with its conventional air force becoming masters of the skies, the Germans had suddenly lost interest in jet power. The HE-178's short but glorious life was over and was destined to spend the rest of its days in a Berlin museum. But there were others in Germany who did not believe that the race for the first jet fighter was over. Quietly working on his own jet aircraft design that would become the ME-262 was a brilliant 41-year-old aeronautical engineer called Wilhelm Messerschmitt. Throughout the 30s, Messerschmitt had been a designer and manufacturer of bombers and fighters. A favorite with the Nazi hierarchy, he was a workaholic and created loyalty from all that knew him. He was very artistic. At home over the course of a weekend, he could design an aircraft part on an A4 sheet of paper, and then the drawing would be ready to be taken into the workshop right away. His designs were that good. He was a very intuitive person, but he would lose his temper a lot. 
Yet whilst the German authorities appeared to have lost interest in their jet industry, in Britain, Frank Whittle's fortunes had changed. After a long and frustrating battle, the British Air Ministry finally agreed to finance and build a factory for him to manufacture his jet engine. The Gloucester Aircraft Company was given the contract to produce an experimental plane that would prove Whittle's engines. It was called the E-28. Finally, on May the 15th, 1941, 20 months after Hans von Ohain's HE-178 had first flown, the Gloucester E-28 took to the air. The first flight of the E-28 was a significant event because obviously this was the final proof of the aircraft's uh, operational use. Whittle overnight became the success. He'd achieved something that previously people thought wouldn't happen, an aircraft flying with no propeller. And they were suddenly giving him congratulations, well done Frank, you know, and Frank Whittle turned around and said, well, it was bloody well designed to fly. Amongst all this excitement was visiting American Army Chief of Staff, General Henry Hap Arnold. He was convinced that this British invention could help to springboard America into the race for the jet. He was very surprised about the fact that the British had a jet-engined aircraft flying and he could only speculate that the Germans were at least as far in their development of a jet aircraft as well. So, enthusiastic about the new jet technology and wanting to emphasize the U.S. need to catch up, Arnold negotiated with the British government to bring an example of Whittle's engine to the United States so that the American turbojet program could begin. Britain's Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, was also eager to get the U.S. committed to the British war effort and agreed to hand over Whittle's jet designs. Churchill's attitude was, how can we involve America in our fight against the dictatorships? And he's seen the, the fact that we would give this, this very latest development of technology to the Americans freely would help them uh, appreciate the sort of problems we were in and later on maybe come down on our side. Hastily, arrangements were made to box up Whittle's engine parts and plans. Amidst top secrecy, this precious cargo was loaded into a bomber and flown to Bowling Field in Washington, D.C. It was then transported to the General Electric plant in Massachusetts. Gentlemen, I'll give you the Whittle engine. Unlike the small scale of development that Whittle faced in Great Britain, the American effort in modifying and improving his engine in the United States was on a large scale. At the General Electric plant, the company used its experience in heat-resistant and high-strength alloys to modify and improve what would eventually become the General Electric IA engines. I cannot overemphasize the secrecy and the importance of this work. We know that both the Italians and the Germans are working on jets. I hardly need tell you that they must not win the race. General, given unlimited priority, we will have the first unit running on test in six months. Meanwhile, in Germany, despite Nazi indifference to the jet, Heinkel's team continued to develop a jet fighter. On March the 30th, 1941, the Heinkel 280 had its first test flight. Triumphantly, Hans von Ohain was amongst those who reveled in this momentous occasion. Powered by his jet engines, the plane was a superb design. Capable of speeds in excess of 500 miles per hour, it was light years ahead of all its competitors. The test flight was a huge personal success for Heinkel and von Ohain. But sadly, their jet fighter was not destined to be a winner. At the core of Heinkel's problem with getting contracts for operational jet and rocket aircraft was his inability to play by the rules of the Reich Air Ministry. But on the other hand, Messerschmitt was able to play by the rules and was awarded with substantial contracts. As 1941 drew to a close, Britain, America and Germany were all committed to jet development. But for America, another event made the race more intense. On December the 7th, 1941, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. America's entry into World War II brought a much-needed lifeline to the Allies in the battle against Germany. 
The full-blown race for the first jet fighter was now on. In Britain, the government had finally given the go-ahead for Frank Whittle to develop a jet engine for a fighter. In America, General Electric was pulling out all the stops. Their promise to produce an engine within six months was on target. And in Germany, Hitler now saw the ME262 as a wonder weapon and pushed Messerschmitt for an early completion to get the plane into production. They wanted us to get a move on and granted permission to any of Herr Messerschmitt's proposals. The German jet aircraft industry was now moving forward at full speed. Research and innovation was everywhere. Designers and engineers came up with concepts that were years in advance of their time. Wind tunnel tests into swept wings and fuselage configurations enabled the German plane makers to be way ahead of the Allies. It was a mixture of calculations, calculate this and that, and comparisons, and carrying out tests until you got the feeling that this was it. And then we built it, and tried it, and measured it, and it was fine. On July the 18th, 1942, the ME-262 made its debut. But the first flight of the day was not without its problems. We ran into difficulties when the plane's tail would not lift up. So we ran tests and discovered that if the pilot braked gently at speed, then the tail would lift up. It worked. When the aircraft reached 120 miles per hour, the pilot touched the brakes, the nose dropped, the tail came up, and the ME-262 took to the air. The performance of the ME-262 in its test flight was incredible. On its second flight, it climbed to 11,500 feet and reached a speed of 450 miles per hour. Already it was faster than any Allied planes in existence. Soon German pilots would be flying at speeds that others could only have dreamt of. But would the ME-262 be the answer to Hitler's dreams? The ME-262's jet engines could now thrust it at speeds of over 550 miles per hour. It could simply outfly anything in the sky. Armed with four 30mm cannons, each was capable of delivering over 80 explosive shells into the enemy. Future plans were also to include 24 wing-slung air-to-air rockets. Nicknamed the Swallow, this awesome machine heralded the dawning of a new age of battle. And for Hitler's Luftwaffe, it was hoped that when it finally met the Allied forces, its hell would be unleashed. The successful test flight of the German ME-262 had at last proved to the Luftwaffe generals this was the fighting machine that could win the war. But a lot of development work was still needed before it could become the all-conquering answer to Nazi dreams. In America, too, scientists were working around the clock. GEC had successfully completed trials with their jet engines and the Bell Aircraft Corporation was contracted to supply an experimental plane to test them. On October the 1st, 1942, amidst great secrecy, America's first jet aircraft, called the XP-59A, was flown at Murak Dry Lake in California. But the tests were disappointing. The aircraft could only manage a maximum speed of 390 miles per hour, this speed was below many of the German and Allied piston-powered planes. But the XP-59A did play an important part in the race and was to be the foundation of America's future jet aircraft industry. The American turbojet development program proceeded at a slow pace because the overall objective of the American military was to win the war with the weapons at hand. The construction in large numbers of conventional piston engine aircraft such as the North American P-51 Mustang and the Boeing B-17, those were seen as the weapons that would win the war. So looking at jet technology, it was seen as a long-term development. Yet in Germany, 
the ME262 was given top priority as it went through a period of intense evaluation. In May 1943, the Luftwaffe's most famous air race, Adolf Gallant, flew the ME262 for the first time. After the flight, he was amazed, saying, this is not a step forward, this is a leap. He also described the flight as like being pushed by angels. Hitler, too, was becoming more and more excited about the plane's performance. With his Reich now coming under daily attacks from Allied bombers, he ordered the ME-262 to be put into full-scale production, not only as a fighter, but also as a bomber. He felt that if he had a thousand jet bombers, they could halt or at least delay the expected Allied invasion. Messerschmitt had been asked if you could drop bombs with it. Of course you could drop bombs with it, but that was not what it had been built for. And two bombs were only fitted underneath because we'd been ordered to do so. Some blamed Hitler for it, and others tried to put the blame elsewhere. It was all nonsense. The confusion in trying to build fighter versions and modify the plane to be a bomber would be a disastrous mistake. On June the 6th, 1944, the Allies successfully landed on the beaches of France. The invasion of Europe had begun. Vainly, the Germans tried to throw the invaders back, but with the Allies having complete air superiority, and with no operational ME-262s available, the Germans were forced to retreat. On hearing this, it is reported that Hitler flew into a rage, and two days after D-Day, he announced a Führerbefehl, an order of the leader, which demanded the ME-262 be made only as a bomber. Despite Hitler's orders, limited numbers of the fighter version did come off the production line. They were quickly rushed to the training schools. Destined to be flown by the elite, it was here that the cream of the German Luftwaffe saw the ME-262 for the first time. We were surprised when we first saw it standing there. The guns were incredible. The training of these pilots was given top priority, but with the tide of war running against them, there was little time for classroom tactics. The training was very simple, four half days of lessons. Then you had to do your first flight on your own, because the machines were single-seaters. We had to give our word that we would not damage the machines. Otherwise, we would be punished or immediately sent back to the units we came from. With that warning uppermost in their minds, even for these experienced pilots, the first flights were always nerve-wracking. The sergeant who was on the wing explained to me the interior of the plane and especially what to look out for. For example, the gas for the engine was only stepped up very slowly. Otherwise, the engine would stall. The turbine engine had to get used to the speed very slowly. So one had to be very careful there. Once in the air, the experience of flying an ME-262 surpassed all their expectations. For any pilot passionate about flying, it was a most extraordinary experience. Especially so because the roaring engine was not in front of your nose. All the noise was behind you. It was a wonderful feeling. The speed was really enormous. And the flying characteristics were so advantageous. You actually had a sense of confidence in that machine. Although the German pilots would praise the takeoff and speed of the plane, it was the landing that gave them problems. In a 109 plane, one could just switch off the engine and drift down slowly. But in this plane, it wasn't possible at all. I was traveling at a speed of 400 or 500 miles per hour and couldn't reduce it. The plane just wouldn't descend. I looked at the altitude meter and had to fly in circles until I finally reached an altitude of 3,000 feet, then asked for permission to land. 
I lowered the landing gear and slowly approached the runway. Finally, I was able to land safely and was greatly relieved. In contrast to my usual takeoff and landings, I was completely soaked with sweat. The unfortunate thing about earlier starts and landings was that I was completely soaked. Initially, it was planned that only fighter aces would fly the plane, but four years of war had taken its toll on the Luftwaffe's finest. So, regular pilots, some with as little as 10 hours flying experience, were drafted in. But for inexperienced pilots, the ME-262 was not an easy plane to fly, and over 200 pilots were killed in training alone. Of course, the first ones, to whom I count myself as well, we were the best. But those who followed us were often at the beginning of their pilot training and, and didn't cope with the machine. To put those people in the jet was totally irresponsible. We had huge losses there. By mid-1944, those pilots that had survived the training were sent to newly formed squadrons. Ground crews, too, were hastily recruited to service and maintain these new wonder weapons. Generally speaking, my experience was that the ground crew tried very hard to ensure that the planes were always ready for takeoff. I did not get to know them well enough, because I always had to be ready for action and was waiting for an emergency takeoff. Sometimes that would not happen at all. Hence the saying, half of one's life, one waits in vain. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Alarm! Alarm! Oh! Yet the waiting was short-lived. With thousands of bombers now pounding Germany, every available pilot was thrown into action. Helm! Come, come. Really? Yeah, cool. Yeah, it's good. Clear! Hold on, hit me! On July the 25th, 1944, an ME-262 became the first jet airplane to be used in combat when it shot down a British photo reconnaissance mosquito flying over Munich. It now appeared that the race for the jet fighter had been won, and with it, the prize of victory in the skies, which was now within the Luftwaffe's grasp. During the late summer of 1944, more and more German Luftwaffe pilots were taking their new ME-262 jet fighters into battle. It seemed as though finally they now had a weapon that could beat the Allied bombers and their high-speed escorts. There were two groups of four Mustangs in close formation, and they were so incredibly confident. They hadn't seen me, and that was a mistake. I actually felt sorry for the guys as they hadn't noticed me. I came from deep, low right and flew in there. We had four 30mm guns, the Mark 108. That was an incredible fire. Because the whole thing presented itself to me as a long, outstretched point you couldn't actually miss. And then two fighters dropped down. With one, I saw a parachute. With the other one, I didn't. That was... Such a case. By late 1944, the 262s were attacking the Allied bombers with devastating effect. Allied fighter and bomber crews were unsure how to deal with them. Their speed and firepower were just too potent. He's so close to the ground we couldn't get a shot. And then he goes, Shoo! like, bye, fellas. And I just said to the rest of the crew, we just saw a real pilot. We were jumped by an ME-262 and only got a, sh a very short glimpse of him because he made a, an attack from uh, about 3 o'clock high. And he came down through the group and he went by so fast we couldn't hardly see him. <laughs> it was really a shock because it was like nothing we'd seen before. 
The German pilots had not felt such supremacy in the air since the early days of the war. They felt sure that this incredible plane would turn the tide. I flew to the area around Dresden and went down to 16,000 feet. When I spotted two fighter planes, as they were above me, I increased my altitude and I took one of the fighter planes in my sights. In those days, the machine guns and cannons were automatically switched on. I had four cannons, and I gave off a burst of fire. And before I knew it, the pilot had parachuted out of his plane. Where I had hit him, I did not know. It was all very new, much too fast. And then suddenly, I saw the second fighter plane in front of me. And I fired at it, and it went down, surrounded by smoke that looked like a flag. But it was the bombers that were the ME-262's real prey. Luftwaffe pilot Alfred Arms was on a routine patrol when he came across a B-17 on its 13th mission. Everyone quickly chose a plane, without having any great discussions about whether they were going to take this or the other plane. Instead, you would say, the best position for me is the one in the middle. After all, there were enough planes in the sky, which made it easy to pick one. The rear gunner in that particular B-17 was 19-year-old Craig Bennett. He came so fast, all you had time was just pull the triggers and let the guns fire and aim them as best you could at this thing. I was aiming at a fortress when suddenly ahead of me there was a large wall of fire into which the captain of my squadron and others disappeared. The first plane was the leader and he hit our plane and the plane just blew up. The whole plane exploded, his plane and ours. I was able to fly over the wall of fire. It turned out that the fortress had exploded and taken two adjacent planes with her. That's how big the explosion was. And the tail broke off and started falling. And the rest of the plane was gone. I was the only one that got out of my aircraft. Craig Bennett was to spend the rest of the war as a POW. Yet it was not all a one-sided fight. Once they got over the shock of these new wonder weapons, the Allied pilots slowly began to learn how to deal with the German jet. The first problem was how to overcome the huge speed disadvantage. The pilots found that when they put the Mustang into a steep dive, their speed was the same as the ME-262. So I just bent the throttle as far as it could forward without going through the stop and uh, slowly, very, very slowly, started gaining a little on the guy because he was making little turns. And each time he'd turn a little bit, I'd get a little closer. So I finally got up in range and this guy was inexperienced, I'm sure, because when he saw the first tracers either go by him or hit his airplane, he made a turn. If he'd have put his nose down, hugged the ground, we probably never got it. And immediately, where we got in range, and bam. The Allied pilots also found that the ME-262 did not respond as quick in a turn as propeller planes. This would have deadly consequences. I was on the inside of his circle and I was able to get a bead on him and shoot in front of him so he would fly into the bullets. But it was on takeoff and landing that the ME-262 was at its most vulnerable. Allied pilots lay in wait around the airfields. Hundreds of 262 pilots were to die in this way. The Americana seemed the Americans changed their tactics to concentrate on all airfields where jet fighter units were stationed. This way, they were able to hit us when we were most vulnerable, during startup and landing. During takeoff, we did not have enough speed. 
and when landing, we had to reduce it. That was the problem. With the tide of war turning against them, the ME262 superiority in the skies was over. More and more planes were being shot down, and fear was ever present in the remaining pilots' minds. The thoughts would only enter your head at a later stage, when within the squadron, nearly every third or fourth person had to be replaced every week. And the longer the war lasted, the more this occurred. I believe this led to the end of the war. Furious that the new jet squadrons were being wasted by the German high command and under insistence of General Galland and other famous air aces, Hitler reluctantly allowed every 20th ME262 to be built as a fighter. It was a completely wrong thing to do. And some of the bombers were used as night fighters. They had totally misjudged the situation. One can only assume that they were following their own delusions. The infamous Führerbefehl, the order of the leader, was at last rescinded in late 1944. Hitler finally ordered that all ME-262s should now be built as fighters. But with the Allies marching into Germany, was it too little, too late? By early 1945, and with nearly all her factories destroyed by the Allies, Germany was finding it almost impossible to produce the jet fighters so desperately needed. So a novel solution was brought about. The bombing did slow everything down. But if we had enough material, we could have manufactured the required numbers by, let's say, 43 or 44. In the end, we got used to it or went into the woods, where we put up large shelters, camouflage tents. Manufactured throughout Germany, sections of the ME-262 were then delivered under cover of darkness by truck, horse and cart and even bicycle to be fully assembled in forests. Over 800 were to be built in this way. But as more and more ME-262s were being destroyed by Allied fighters, so too were the cream of the German Luftwaffe. One day a plane came crashing down above me and my plane caught fire. I had to bail out. That's how I had to land with my parachute. And that was the end of the war for me. There was suddenly a big bang. For a couple of brief moments I did not look back as I would usually do. I was looking in the sky to see what had happened. There was a flash somewhere. Then I saw the engine was catching fire. At that stage, I was about 4,000 feet above the layer of cloud. Upon seeing the fire, I immediately dived into the clouds. I changed course and turned left in order to get out of the line of fire. I wanted to jump out with a parachute. And then I remembered that someone had once told me that if you're too frightened to jump out, then push the joystick to the side, stand on it with your foot, and push yourself off. That's what I did. Towards the end of the war, there simply were not enough trained pilots to fly the jet fighter. Even if there had been, the production of the ME-262 had ground to a halt. They simply could not build enough jet fighters to stem the tide of the conquering Allies. Germany finally surrendered on May the 7th, 1945. Her cities and factories were totally smashed. So too was her jet aircraft industry. In the following months, Britain, America and Russia squabbled over the carcasses of the wonder jets that were scattered throughout Germany. In picking through the bones, they began to build their own jet aircraft industries. In an operation called Operation Lusty, under the command of Colonel Watson, 
the Americans gathered all the German planes they could find. They were flown to Cherbourg in France and then shipped to America for evaluation. Watson's Whizzers were a group of American pilots tasked with capturing flying German aircraft to the French coast and bringing them back to the United States for testing and evaluation. The commitment to getting this new technology back to the United States, and they were actually racing against the British and the Soviets to do this, would ensure that America would have an aeronautical superiority in the post-war period. The Americans began an extensive testing program of the ME-262 by analyzing the jet turbines and wing design of this German fighter they were able to produce their own design, which was to become the fabulous F-86 Sabre. It's not until that the German jet technology that's brought over through Operation Lusty and other programs that aircraft like the North American F-86 with its swept wing especially reflect the German technology of, and the way to design a proper and efficient jet airplane. The Russians also delved into the ME-262 secrets and with the help of British jet technology would later build the MiG-15. Really the boost for the Russian engineering industry was what they captured from the Germans at the end of the Second World War. The main thing though really for the Russian aircraft industry was when we gave them our latest engine and that allowed the MiG-15 to go from being a, an average aircraft with good design to a world beater. Along with the ME-262's move to America went designer Hans von Ohain. He was to become the chief scientist of aero propulsion for the United States Air Force. Frank Whittle eventually moved to America, where he became a consultant on several aviation projects. Wilhelm Messerschmitt, the father of the ME-262, remained in Germany and helped in rebuilding their shattered aircraft industry. Hundreds of Allied aircraft were to fall victim to the ME-262, but at a terrible price. Hardly any of the 1,400 ME-262s that were built survived the war. Yet many people still believe that if the ME-262 had entered service earlier, it could have saved Germany from defeat. There has been a lot of speculation. And perhaps if they could have introduced the whole program half a year earlier. But if you are truthful, would it have decided the war? Only the gods know. Germany had won the race to get a jet fighter into the air. It outclassed all its rivals. And in its short operational life of seven months, the ME-262 had pushed forward the frontiers of air combat to new heights. At the time, it was the best fighter plane in the world. And as an aircraft, uh, it was an exceptional solution. We were surprised that the others could not do better. The ME-262 was undoubtedly one of the most famous aeroplanes in the whole history of German aviation, if not the world. Born out of a need to be a fearsome destroyer, from the day it first flew, it spelled the end of propeller-driven aircraft and heralded the dawning of the new jet age. <laughs>